situation. But we'll, it will come up a little bit later in the talk. But we have to make a good medical decision. We gotta know what we're doing. We gotta know we're not doing harm. We gotta understand the safety profile, understand something about dosing. So I'll do now switch to this part, which will be the review of where we are in Angelman syndrome. We're doing an antisense oligonucleotide with the GTX-102. Many of you are probably aware of the program. On the bottom there on this graph, there's this, the targeting of GTX-102 is shown. It's in um, cluster two, a particular place near the five prime end of the antisense message, based on the work of Scott Dindo, who is here somewhere. Where is Scott? Oh. Um, basically, you know, the work showed that this five prime in the message, we're able to have a bigger impact on knocking down the antisense and inducing EB3 expression. So, just to be clear, we just did talk about transparency. We're talking transparently. I've received some criticism for doing that. I've explained why we do what we do. We'll talk about where we are, but this is still an investigational product. We still haven't proven efficacy and safety yet. We're in the process. And open label data has its limitations. But we believe what we're seeing is real. And we think we need to continue moving forward. So we'll talk about that data. But this caveat is always true. So the program, just to summarize, and I won't go through the, all the history, is what we're doing right now is we're treating we're providing four monthly doses, dose one, two, three, four, and you can see the valuation points. And then evaluating day 128 is a few weeks after the fourth dose, which is not very far after loading the patient with drug. We then go into an every three month maintenance phase. We've treated and presented data on cohort four and five on the, on the box on the right. Um, I won't present six and seven yet. We're just presenting today what data we, we presented in July with some update on safety and other, other factors. But um, these doses for these cohorts I'm showing will be the, at the two lowest doses on the rung. Now we're starting low because we had that safety event at a higher dose. So we're starting low and we're going to work our way up monitoring safety carefully and looking at efficacy and trying to understand where do we get enough efficacy to be comfortable and still maintain safety? Some of the kids now, in the, after the first four doses, if they haven't achieved a level of improvement that we consider enough, which is improvement at least two domains of two plus, they can titrate up to the next dose level. So those kids that started at the low doses still get a chance to get to higher doses. They're not stopped. And this is a dose titration strategy. It's part of what I prefer in the rare disease world, because if you do everything fixed and regimented, it takes you forever to get to an answer, and then all the kids that get contribute to a low-dose cohort get stuck at low dose forever, and that's just not right. And so titrating is the way to get individualized dosing. And what I'll guarantee you is that no matter what, in neurology, you'll see variable doses. It's just going to be true. Not everyone will, need, will get the same dose in the end, I believe. So what did we see? The CGI score, the Global Impression Scale score, this is now being conducted outside the US at Canada and the UK. And these are different investigators scoring. And these are the nine patients that we had data at that time. You can see that the patients, among those that respond, that they have four domains that are responding. And some of them, particularly two with a sleep, and one with communication, had two plus or better. We were very encouraged by this. Some people didn't respond. There are two patients not responding. But there's enough multi-main responder, enough detail to what parents are describing that's responding to give us confidence. And I'll dive a little bit deeper. But this is the CGI. This is the investigator's opinion of what they're seeing at that time. It's not the latest data at this point. Now, when you dive into the objective data, which is the data that's now a third-party psychologist who is evaluating. What we are seeing in the Canada-UK patients, in the columns for the Bailey receptive and expressive communication, there's nine patients listed vertically there. There's just nine patients without their patient ID numbers. But the top six are the, are the younger ones, and the three on the bottom are the older ones. You can see that there are six out of nine had green scores with an asterisk. That means their change was larger than what's normally the variation of the test. Statistically different from normal variation. I would say to you, having been involved with the Bailey test in multiple MPS programs and other programs, and Ali Skreiner that works with me as well, 
we've never seen Bailey scores really move. So these movements are something unusual and I think important. The, express, the receptive seems to be more advanced than recept expressive. Expressive is more complicated. I think that makes sense. I think it's encouraging. We think it's real, but it's still early and we're just at the beginning. If you look at the ORCA, and there was a lot of discussion about the ORCA yesterday, you can see that the ORCA, two of the patients and the young patients had statistically significant improvements in their ORCA scores. The three older kids also had an improvement, um, not quite at the significant level, but encouraging signs of some movement in the ORCA as well. I, I'm not going through all the verbatims on the right. Those are details that just tell you a little more about why patients are thinking what they're thinking. One domain that was really profound and is sleep. Now, we all know how important sleep is, and it's particularly important if you're not getting it. But um, we saw in the first five patients, there were a couple kids with sleep problems that had a very profound effect on sleep. And we are seeing a profound effect in the kids with the worst sleep problems, and particularly uh, uh, 11301. That patient there has a mind, this is the Angelman severity scale for sleep. This is a quantitative scale of how much sleep they get and how their sleep character is. This patient went from a severe to a mild, a minus four. This is only a six point scale, so you can't go, you can only change uh, that far. But this is a person who was not sleeping, waking up three or four times a night, and now sleeping 12 hours straight. Um, and so that was very unusual. And so we've seen this pattern in sleep before, and it's been, um, it's fairly important because for the family, everyone's not sleeping because of this, and everyone then is affected the next day. But we're real encouraged by how much a profound effect on sleep we're seeing. The EEG is an area we think is important. I think there's a lot of good belief that EEG should show it. Now, before we saw some trends to improvement in delta power on the right, but on the left, it kind of looks mixed right now. It's not really showing the effect uh, that we saw before. We think it's the dose. This is from the lowest doses now. This is not the higher doses. So we're, we, I think it's just a sign we need to go up on the dose. But uh, we'll look at the EEG as one of those factors that will help us look at the physiology of what we're doing. And I think we would expect that the delta power should go down. So the safety. Now, those efficacy gels were from the lowest doses, but since then the patients have been titrating. We now have people getting multiple doses at the 10 to 12 range, and patients treated for over a year. We haven't seen the adverse event of weakness in anyone or even any neurological problem of that type. So we're feeling pretty good about total 109 doses administered, 61 milligram dose accumulation. So we're feeling like we're, we're getting a much better place of expression um, of of dosing and without having the safety problem. We're still trying to learn what's going on, how the drug works, but I think the fact we're not recurring the safety problem is important. I think the fact we're seeing efficacy and we're now moving into a, a dose range of the 10 to 12, which is where we'd expect from non-human primate data to give us near maximal knockdown um, is important. As we load at those doses, we hope we'll be able to demonstrate even better on the efficacy side. Now, Two patients from that first trial, all five have been unable to get drug because of FDA's restriction on that. We then provided the additional data they'd asked from us, which took time, but we weren't able to get the US open promptly, and we've, two of those patients have gone to Canada to get treated and have gotten two or four doses, and they didn't have any recurrence of their problem, which is good, uh, and they seem to be having a recurrence or improvement again that they had seen. Um, so we're encouraged by that. But as while this is going on, the crises exist. And so I, um, I'm sorry, I got a, a letter from one patient from the first study, you know, uh, who's distraught because if for two years they've been off the drug and they had been treated and they sent me this letter. And, you know, they said, you know, with, when they got the, treated before, for the first time in life, the patient was able to sleep through the night feed themselves, play with their sister, be truly connected, problem solve, follow directions, learn new skills. And now they've lost every single thing. And uh, they're just distraught. Two years have already passed now and we couldn't get them back. 
although I, normally I would not have done compassion use in a program like this, I felt like, you know, this is one of those crises that's going on for this family, and we were having trouble getting everyone into Canada um, promptly enough. So we decided to tell them to send the letter to the FDA, and the FDA connected them with Dr. Kravis, Barry Kravis, to do expanded access. And um, that, the FDA said yes, and the patient just got redosed. So they they raised the the cap, which in the U.S. program, which I'm not talking about today, was at two, which was arbitrary. They've raised it to seven and a half, which is good, and we're hoping we're submitting more data on higher doses to hopefully get the cap raised further so we can hope would be to open the U.S. sites and to get the trial working across U.S., Canada, and the U.K. all together. Now, just to reiterate in bold, we're not playing compassion use program for arrangement. It's really not the right disease and situation. I know it's very urgent for everyone, but we really need to figure out our dosing and safety here. This is just the right way. We just can't do it. And we will be doing studies that would expand who gets treated, because I have a lot of questions about that as well. So um, we're continuing to load to do uh, higher loading doses now in the next cohorts. And we'll, we'll be continuing treating the earlier cohorts at higher doses and continue to monitor them for safety. We expect an early year to expand to 20 young, 20 older patients to get more safety data. That's our expectation at this point. We, and hopefully in the US if, if the FDA allows. So that's the phase two study. If we can prove the dose and efficacy and get confident that we have what we need, then we'll proceed with doing a randomized placebo controlled trial, which I know no one wants to hear, but the truth is for Angelman syndrome in this ASO, because of the kinds of assessments that doing one high quality randomized trial is the right way to get proof that the drug is doing what it's doing. However, there are a lot of other subtypes of Angelman which are not in this. This is age four to 17 that are not included. And so we would expect to do studies in UPD, missense in the younger and older patients in parallel studies that wouldn't, we would expect not to do control studies, but do supportive studies that we can look at and make sure we're covering the Angelman population. I'm not afraid of treating UPD. I do think actually it's going to be fine based on what we know, and we can go more into that. But that's where we are right now. Um, I think it's encouraging. We're seeing some good effects so far. Safety's been good, but we have to keep vigilant and managing carefully. And I do believe now at the dose level we're at, we need to treat enough patients to get a real sense of the safety profile and assessment of the efficacy to be able to move to the next stage of this program. So uh, that's the story. I have lost track of time, so I'm not sure if I'm way off the mark. But uh, I want to thank families you know, for participating and for tolerating the long delays and the challenges. Um, and certainly investigators everywhere, UK, Canada, uh, and the US for all the support in getting this done. And Dr. Kravis, Barry Kravis, for all of her exceptional commitment. Exceptional commitment. Jack's team, of course, um, have completed. Allison's still working with us, but Paula. Allison, Jennifer is here somewhere, and Scott, who has now joined us. Um, and Scott Dindo, of course, because he's the guy that gave us the insights and inventions and um, put us in position maybe of doing something amazing, right, for the Angelman community. Thank you. <laughs>